Man, what a uh, man, what a blessing, Russ, to have you lead us in worship this morning and singing all those great America songs, man. Battle of the man, battle of the or the yeah, the hymn of, of America there and, and Star Spangled Banner and you know, like I said, I um, I thought about doing a uh, I thought about doing a 4th of July themed sermon, um, talking about, you know, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, talking about how, how great this nation once was and, and what it's going to take to get back there, but I mean, I'm, pr I'm pretty confident that all of us in this room know what it's going to take. Um, but, I, but I do want to share, I, I, I do want to share a, a few thoughts with you regarding Second Chronicles seven fourteen. You know, in in this text, Ezra Ezra by the way Ezra wrote the book of Ezra. Ezra most likely we believe too pinned Nehemiah because Ezra and Nehemiah kind of were working tandem when they were rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem and the gates. But Ezra also pinned um, First and Second Chronicles. Um, Ezra would, would outline for us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, four things that God's people must do. They need to first humble themselves. They need to pray. They must seek the face of the Lord. And finally, most importantly, I believe, they must turn from their wicked ways. And it was upon those four things that God said he would in return hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And I don't believe that it's coincidental that we find the order that we find the things in 2 Chronicles 7.14. I don't think that it's coincidental that they're laid out the way that they are. The first thing God asks us to do as a nation and as a people is to first humble ourselves. 2 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, Casting your care upon him, for he careth for you. But we must humble ourselves. We are admonished then to pray. We know that 1 Thessalonians says to pray without ceasing. Jesus says in Luke 18, 1, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't grow weary in your praying. Because it's very easy. To grow weary in your praying. I, I grow weary all the time in my prayers. Lord, things that things aren't being answered. Things aren't going the way that I prayed them to go. The Lord isn't responding in the manner that I need him to respond or in the timing that I want him to respond in. And so it's easy to grow weary. But Jesus says to faint not. Don't grow weary in your petitions. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And I love what Paul says here. He goes, pray and then watch. When you pray, watch and wait for the Lord to do what he's going to do. And, and I love that because we are encouraged there to pray faithfully. To pray expectantly. Do we expect that God can do what he says he can do? When we pray, do we pray expecting God to answer? Well, if you're praying the way that God asks you to pray, the way that Jesus taught us to pray, praying in the will of the Father, you better believe he's going to answer. Because he can't help himself. Then we're told after we humble ourselves and after we, 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 we begin to pray to seek the face of the Lord. 
Psalm 105 forces us to seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. But what does it mean to, to seek the face of God? God is spirit, so how can I seek a face that no one literally has ever seen ever? Not, not even the greatest saints of the Bible, not even Moses saw the face of God. Because he told Moses, if anybody sees my face, you're going to die. But what does it mean to seek the face of the God? His face of God, it means to seek his presence. Seek the very presence of God. And we have the promise of Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. Folks, the promise is that if we are searching for God with all of our heart, we're going to find him. He can't help himself but to reveal himself to you and I and to those that seek him. It's a biblical principle. Right. You see it all throughout the scriptures. Every single time people sought the Lord, they found him. Right. Right. Why? Because he's always there all the time anyways. We just need to get our blinders turned off, taken off our eyes to see that every once in a while. But after we humble ourselves, after we pray, after we seek the face of the Lord, Ezra tells us to turn from our wicked ways. In other words, we've been studying it in John chapter 1. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Joel 2.13, I love this from the prophet Joel. He says, and rend your heart and not your garments. Don't, listen, don't, don't be like those knuckleheads in the temple. I'm tearing my garment because, you know, so-and-so sinned. So-and-so was caught in adultery. What, what did they do? They always, they always tore their garments, right? That was an act of of, of uh, showing their displeasure, if you will, with sin. But Joel says to rend your heart, your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger. He is great in kindness and repenteth him of the evil. And so the blueprint, folks, Church family, for forgiveness, the blueprint for healing can be found in our text. If we truly want God to hear us, if we truly want God to forgive us, if we truly want God to heal us, then we must humble ourselves. We must pray. We must seek the face of the Lord, and we must turn from our wicked ways. Right. The blueprint's there. Right. Right. Uh, again, it's just one of those things that, that God says, Solomon, you don't have to figure it out. Right. Thank you, Lord, because I'm not that smart. Right. It's all right there for us, folks. The blueprint for it is in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. That's what this land needs, folks. But listen to me, and listen to me very clearly. It's got to start here. Mm. It's got to start in the home. That's right. You need to take that to your homes. Right. Right. It's got to start there. Because if it doesn't start there, it ain't going to start anywhere else. That's right. And no, folks, it can't start in the church until it starts in the home. That's, right. That's just a fact. That's right. And so with that being said, I want to move on. You know, last week we, we talked about and were introduced to the Lamb of God. Remember the voice in the wilderness introduced us to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But, but remember, this wasn't no ordinary lamb. This, this wasn't like the, the sacrificial lambs of the day that were required as an atonement for Israel's sins. Remember, they had to continually sacrifice lambs and bullocks and goats. Why? 
Well, because the reality is, folks, we're in a constant state of sin, are we not? Right? So that requirement of the sacrificial lambs each and every day was was burdening, if you will, the people of Israel. I, I mean, listen, it was a burden. It, it was. But but this 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 wasn't like the other lambs. This lamb was different. This lamb, the Lamb of God, was the final sacrifice that God would require for the sins of the whole world. You see, Israel was wrapped up in the sacrifices for Israel. The sacrifices for the, for the 12 tribes of Israel, for the nation of Israel. That's what those sacrifices were about. You as a Gentile, or myself as a Gentile, could never go into the temple and have my, have my sins atoned for, if you will, because of the sacrifices that Israel was making, that the high priests were making. Right? That was just for the nation of Israel. That law, that commandment that, that was given by Moses centuries before, that wasn't for the Gentile. That wasn't for the whole world. That was just for, that dealt with Israel's sins. Right. So what about the rest of us? Like, are we left out to dry by God? Like, I, I guess, you know, I guess I know what, what my fate is, right? No. Jesus. Mm, that's it. Jesus was the answer to all that. The blood from that lamb was shed once for all, and it's never required to be shed again. Never required to be shed again. It was the final act, if you will, the final remission that meant blood sacrifices were no longer required. Not even... Israel needed to do it anymore as long as they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood was so pure, was so precious, and so powerful that it wiped away the sins of the world. We also looked at how the wilderness was a place of preparation for John the Baptist. If you had a chance this past Tuesday to listen to um, the podcast, Revelation Communication, I was actually joined by, by Ryan and, and uh, by our good friend, Ralph Haynes. We talked about the wilderness. So good, the, what is the wilderness? I believe because it's found in the Bible, God used the wilderness to prepare. God used the wilderness to um, sometimes... Punish? He punished the nation of Israel, right, for, for a number of years. But, but the wilderness has been a place where when, when God's people were there, if they sought him in the wilderness, they got way more than I think that they had prepared themselves for. They got way more. And while John the Baptist... I believe had gone into the wilderness knowing Jesus' cousin. I don't think that there was any argument that, that John didn't know Jesus because if you recall part of our text last week, he said twice, and I knew him not. While, he, while I believe he knew him as cousin, he didn't know him quite yet as the Messiah, as the one that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. But you better believe, folks, that when John came out of the wilderness... He knew Jesus is king. And that's sometimes what the wilderness does for you and I. That, that, if we're being honest with one another, we're resistant to it sometimes. But the wilderness prepares us to see and to realize Jesus is king. And when we can come to that realization that Jesus is king, when our hearts and our minds can be prepared for that revelation in our lives, whatever it is that he is guiding us to do or, or leading us to do comes with this sense of peace and understanding that, man, if I know who Jesus is, I can go forth and do exactly what he's calling me to do. And that's how John the Baptist felt. He goes into the wilderness probably like, man, what am I going to gain out here? What am I going to do out here? Is something going to be revealed out to me out here? He, he, he talks to God. He learns from God. He surrenders him and submits himself to God, most importantly. And he's revealed from God 
who Jesus is. And so when he gets back into town, when he goes to the Jordan River, when he sees Jesus, it's no longer cousin. It's behold, look everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. But folks, it had to happen that way from the wilderness. We also got introduced to the first disciples of Jesus who, who followed him one day and, and basically said, if you remember the last couple of verses of our text last week, Rabbi, hey, listen, where are you going? What, what are you doing, Rabbi? Basically, we want to go with you. We want to go and talk with you. And we learned that one of the two disciples mentioned in last week's text was Andrew. But who was Andrew the brother of? Simon Peter. And we know a whole lot about Peter, don't we? And so this week, we're going we're gonna to meet just a few more characters. I mentioned earlier, we're going we're gonna to actually meet Peter, or Simon as he's referred to. Cephas, he's actually called Cephas, and I'll get into that in a few moments. We're also going to meet Philip, and uh, we're also going to meet Bartholomew or Nathaniel. He's, he's given a couple of different names. Um, so with that being said, if you don't have your Bibles open yet to John chapter 1, Go ahead and get them there. Our text this morning is going to be out uh, uh, from verses 41 to 51. Uh, if you can look ahead there, we're actually going to finish out chapter 1 this morning. So read along with me as I start at verse 41. It says, he first, speaking of Andrew, he first, first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to, to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed is in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, Jesus told him, I saw you. I love that. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Church family, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, for these moments that lie ahead, Father God, Lord, you know that I, I was wrestling with the flesh this morning, Lord God. I, I was wrestling with you, Father. And Lord God, I would pray right now, Father, that you would just move me aside. Lord God, that, that you would have your way with me, Father God, that you would strengthen me, Lord, that you would provide everything that I need this morning, Lord God, to preach your message up here, Father God. May every word spoken be divinely inspired by the, by the very Holy Spirit of God himself, Lord God, would our eyes, would our minds, would our hearts be open to this message, Father God, that you have guided me and, and, and helped me to prepare this morning. And Father God, would you be glorified in us all. Lord God, I thank you. Lord God, I love you. And I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, the first point of this morning's sermon, the only point of this morning's sermon, but it's a profound one, ladies and gentlemen, is follow me. And by me, I, I don't mean me, I mean Jesus. So we know that Andrew, 
the first thing he does, the first person that he goes to is his brother, Simon Peter. You know, there's something, there's something to be said about the zeal of a, of a young convert or of, of a new believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's something just to be said about that. You know, here we have this, this older brother. Andrew was actually the older brother of Simon Peter, who last week we learned that he went and hung out with Jesus in the evening. And he most likely, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon by the time, you know, Jesus says, hey, come and follow me. And so they hung out for the evening. And in his excitement, after learning that he was the Lamb of God, because he's down there at the Jordan River when John announces him, after having maybe supper with him that night, and no doubt listening to Jesus talk, the first person that he thinks about is his brother. I, I just love the zeal of somebody that, that just learns about the Lord for the first time. They accept the Lord Jesus Christ into their hearts and into their life. And man, are they filled with excitement. Yes, that's right. I got to go tell somebody. Right. This is the greatest news I've ever had. I think about the man who found the, the, the great treasure. We, we, we learned about that in, in our parables of Jesus study on Wednesday nights a few weeks back. The man who found the great treasure and he buried it and he went and bought, sold all that he had and he bought the land that the treasure was on. Man, I have to have this. This is so important to me. Or the man that found that great pearl and he went and sold all that he had just to purchase that, that great pearl and this great treasure, this great gem, if you will, that Andrew found in the Messiah is not only worth giving everything up for in order to obtain it, but folks, he's worth sharing. He's worth sharing. And that's the excitement of someone who had just received the greatest gift anyone could ever give them. Folks, y'all remember on Christmas morning the excitement in your lives when you open presents? Especially the presents that you asked for, not the socks that maybe grandma sent you. No offense if you're a sock sending granny, but I'm just telling you, kids don't find a whole lot of joy out of that. I, I don't know why. I'm In my 40s, I love socks. Okay? But you can imagine, like you're that little kid and you're opening these gifts and, oh my gosh, look what I got. I got to go share this with everybody. Well, I, I don't want to share it, but I got to share it with people, right? I, I, I want to tell people about it. You know, and I, and I remember as a kid, I'm, 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 I'm opening up gifts and I'm, and I'm you know, back then it's, it was G.I. Joe's and it was, it was Transformers and, and it was all these other cool things when I was a kid. And, and, and I remember getting these things and, and then I had to go share it with my brothers. Again, not actually share the toys, but I wanted to go show my brothers. Look what I got. This is the coolest thing in the world. It brought me great excitement. That's often where we find these new believers. And I got this great thing that I want to share with you. But unlike maybe the selfish nature that we tend to have on Christmas morning, not only do I want to share this with you, I want to give this to you. Mm, that's right. I want you to have it. I can't wait to share it with you. I can't wait. I can't wait to go home and tell mom and dad what happened at Wednesday night Bible study. I can't wait to show my brothers and sisters what was shown to me. I can't wait to get to school on, on Monday morning and, and speak to my friends about Jesus. Folks, at some point, you know we've all been there. We have. I, I remember being there. There's joy, there's, there's excitement over what Jesus had done for you to the point to where you couldn't stay silent about it. You had to tell somebody. Folks, you had to tell somebody even if nobody was listening. You're telling somebody, right? But that's just the excitement that comes with the new believer. And this is where Andrew was. Man, I, I, I've got to go tell my brother. My brother's going to be so excited. I know he is. 
But he wasn't just telling him what's been going on down at the Jordan River. He wasn't just sharing the fact that, that he's been listening to this wild man from the wilderness preach the kingdom of God. He told Simon Peter, I found the Messiah. I found the Christ. Here's what this statement implies. Andrew knew the scriptures. He had to have known the scriptures. Why? Because he knew that there was a Messiah that the prophet spoke of. So how do you know that you found something unless you're very well aware of what it is when you do find it? I'm sure that in our in our day-to-day -day lives, we probably cross paths with something that has been of great value, but we have no idea it's of great value because we don't know what to look for. But on occasion, if you're maybe educated in something, you run across that thing. And you're like, whoa, I've got to have that. I, I, I love these. I love these stories of, of people going to Goodwill and going to thrift shops and, and finding pieces of art that are worth tens of thousands of dollars that somebody just gave away. The person giving it away, folks, had no idea the value. But to the one that was looking for it, they knew exactly how much that was worth. Andrew knew what he found in Jesus. He found the Messiah. He told his brother that he found him. He also knew the signs by which the Messiah would arrive. And you have to have a little bit of faith sprinkled in there as well, right? Because, I mean, let's be honest, some guy... John the Baptist proclaiming that that dude over there is the Lamb of God? I mean, come, bro, excuse me, but like. So you had to know the scriptures, you had to know the signs, and you had to have faith. You had to believe that this, this new guy coming onto the scene that John the Baptist has been talking about was in fact the very Lamb of God. Folks, that required some faith. But it also had to be revealed to him. John the Baptist revealed Jesus. But the moment that he did, Andrew's like, you're right, that is him. And while John the Baptist opened the door, I believe it was last week's text when Andrew and the other disciple followed Jesus, that it was revealed to him that he indeed was the one that they had been hoping for. Why? Because they asked Jesus, where are you going? Can we go with you? I got to learn more about you. I, I got to make sure that you are who John said you are and who I'm beginning to believe who you are. And the moment he, that's revealed to him, he's off to go get his brother. I love that. And of course, when he tells his brother about Messiah, he not only tells him about Jesus, in verse 42, he says, dude, I'm bringing you to him. Simon, come with me. We're going to go meet him in person. And we know that's where Jesus beheld him, and, and he knew who he was. He, he even knew who his dad was. Simon, the son of Jonah. I picture this scene, if you will, where, where Andrew is, is filled with this zeal. He's, he's filled with this excitement, and he tells Simon, 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 you, you've got to come with me. We, we found the Messiah. We, we found the Christ, and, and I'm going to take you to him right now. Any parent will tell you that when you're in the toy store with your child, You've no doubt heard these words, because I've said them myself. Mom, Dad, come look what I found over here. Come check this out. Right. All with the hope, folks, and don't let your kids fool you, 
that when we show mom and dad this cool thing that we found in the toy aisle, that they not only agree that, oh yeah, son, that's, that's really cool, that's awesome that you found that, but what's the ultimate goal? Can you buy it for me? Right? Every parent has been there with the child. Every child has been there with the parent. Mom, dad, come check out this cool thing I found. And parents, be honest, you know that was you when you were a kid. Ryan even just admitted that he still does that. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, come, come check this out. Now, it's probably guns or fishing gear or something at this point, but it's nevertheless none, you know, exciting, right? Now, now, mom and dad, I'm going to be honest with you, right? And it was for my own good. Mom and dad usually would tell me in a roundabout way to kick rocks. No, not today. Maybe next time, but next time never happened, by the way. But that was the maybe next time. Okay, I believe that. I can't believe I fell for that, but I did. Anyways, but it was for my own good. Now, now, Grandma Stewart, on the other hand, okay? Grandma Stewart, on the other hand, Grandma, Grandma, come check this out. Isn't this the coolest? Oh, yes, Solly, that is so cool. Grandma, can you get it for me? Absolutely. <laughs> because that's what grandmas grandpas do, right? Listen, I'm telling you right now, if, if Addison or, or little Johnny or, or, or baby Ava was to come to me and say, Grandpa, can you get that for me? I wouldn't even think twice. Oh, did, did mom or dad tell you you can't have that? Yeah, I Let's go, because we're going to get it right now. That's just what grandparents do. Grandmas and grandpas are another conversation. Grandma Stewart was a saint, ladies and gentlemen, and I was her favorite grandchild. I'm just convinced of it. <laughs> and listen, that, that, that paid dividends for me when I was a child when it came to G.I. Joe toys, man. I'm telling you. But I digress. I, I need to stop talking about that, because I want to go to the store now. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, folks, isn't there just this, this excitement in us when we get something new, especially if we want it, right? There's this excitement when we receive it. Y'all, listen, folks, y'all know you like to show off a new car, man. If you went and got a brand new spanking car, and it was shiny, and it had that new car smell still inside, and the tires and the dashboard was armor old, maybe the engine had a little bit of a purr to it, you know you're showing that off. Ladies, you know you're showing off jewelry. You know you're showing off a new pair of shoes. Men, you know you've showed off new hunting gear, maybe a new tool or toolbox. Don't be embarrassed about it, folks. Listen, there's no need to be embarrassed about it. You know why? Because it's exciting to share something new that you have. Why? I mean, don't be embarrassed about that. And so Andrew tells Peter, I'm excited and I want to share this with you. Now, when, when Simon gets to Jesus, this is, I, I love this. When Simon gets to Jesus, Jesus knows exactly who he is. Jesus calls him by name. He calls his dad by name. And says, listen, I know you. I know you so well, I even know your daddy. That's how well I know you. And of course Jesus knew him, right? Because in Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. So of course Jesus knows Simon. Right. Of course he knows his dad. Because before he formed us in our mother's belly, he knew us. Folks, that is such a mind-altering and mind-blowing statement. I don't think we can wrap our heads around it. You mean before you formed me in my mom's belly, you knew me? How is that possible? An omniscient God. That's, right. that's how that's possible. Psalm 139, 15 and 16 says this, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet 
There was none of them. All this was done before any of it existed. That's the awesome God that we serve. Remember, and folks, listen, we have to remember who we're talking about. Right? Don't disassociate Jesus with God. Because the very one talking in Jeremiah 1.5 that says he knew us, the very one talking in, Je in Psalm 139 that says that we were, we were curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, the very same one is the one that John says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the same was with God and all things in John 1.3 were made by him and with Without him, not anything was made that was made. Folks, you can't separate God from Jesus. It's the same person. That's why he can tell Simon, I know you. That's right. I know you. So of course Jesus knows who Simon is. And he knows who his dad is. And, and listen, I don't mean to make light of this verse, but this next conversation had to be something funny, man. The first thing Jesus does when he meets Simon is he changes his name. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be a little bit of sense of humor in that. The first thing he does with Simon, he goes, I'm going to call you Cephas. Not that there's anything wrong with Simon or Simon Peter or Peter, but he says, I'm going to call you Cephas. But there was a reason why in the Aramaic, as Jesus was talking to Peter, he called him Cephas, which is being interpreted as the rock. You know, sometimes you, you, you've got to be able to read the scriptures with a little bit of salt, right? And, and this is the Solomon Stewart interpretation, but hey, Simon, son of Jonah, I'm going to change your name. Now, obviously, none of us have been in Peter's shoes, but when you go excuse me, you're, you're going to do what now? You're going you're gonna to change my name? But Simon does not object. Why? Well, because being called a stone or being called a rock isn't a bad nickname to be given. There's many worse nicknames to be given. But Cephas, Simon maybe took that many you mean like, like solid as a rock? You're going to call me C? Okay, I'll take that nickname. That's cool. Especially, folks, when the Messiah himself is giving you that name. Right. You better take that. And, of course, the, the day following in verse 33, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip and say unto him, Follow me. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the same city of Andrew and Peter. So now we're two days removed, folks, from when, from when Andrew met Jesus and began to follow him. We're two days removed now. While John himself does not account for the encounter he first had with Jesus, you can find that in Matthew chapter 4. There, there, there's, there's, a, a, there, there's a sequence of order in, in which the disciples came to follow Jesus, right? And, and while, while John, the, the apostle John, the writer of John, does not account for his own time of, of following Jesus, I want to read with you what Matthew chapter 4, verses 21 and 22 says. And this is after Jesus found Andrew and Peter. It says, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And so in order right now, Andrew and Peter have now followed Jesus, James and John have followed Jesus, and now we're getting to Philip and Nathaniel or Bartholomew. And so Jesus, again, he heads back into Galilee, and he finds Philip. Now, to be clear, folks, Jesus didn't find Philip, okay? He's Jesus. He knows where Philip is. 
but that's where he would meet Philip. And as a simple of a statement as it is, it has a profound impact on the life to whom this is spoken. And that statement is, follow me. As two words, simple, follow me, has an impact that I don't think at the time, at least the first six, had no idea what that would require and what that would entail. It was Andrew and Peter in Matthew 4.19 to whom Jesus first said, follow me. Jesus told Matthew, the tax collector, in Matthew 9.9 as well to follow me. Jesus said in Matthew 16.24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In John 10.27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Two words, profound impact. Follow me. I did want to point out, though, that in almost every instance in the Gospels where Jesus said to follow me, <coughs> folks, it came with a cost. That's right. There was a price to pay That's right. to follow Jesus. For Andrew and, and for Peter, for James and John, they left what they had known, the fishing industry. Right. James and John, it specifically said in Matthew 4, 22, that they left their father. Following Jesus sometimes requires you to, to leave family. You, you remember when, when Elijah goes to anoint Elisha as the new prophet to take up his mantle. What does Elisha say to Elijah? Let me go home and say goodbye to mom and dad. Because Elisha knew the cost of following God. Would he ever see mom and dad again? I don't know. The scriptures never tell us that. But there was a cost that came with following God. The rich young ruler, when Jesus told him to go and sell all your goods and follow me, went away bitterly because he was unwilling to lose what he had to follow Jesus. I say this with no intention of bragging or boasting, but I left a 21-year career to follow him in doing what I'm doing right now. Amen. And, and, and folks, I have not looked back for a moment. Right. Has it been easy? No. Are there days of sorrowness and maybe some bitterness, some frustration, some disappointment? Yes. But I have not looked back and said, I should have stayed there. Right. I should have done that. I was willing to lose that. Mm and am willing to lose it all over again to follow Jesus. You see, if we're going to do what John the Baptist did, and that is decrease so that he may increase, we're going to have to lose some things, folks. We're going to have to let go of some things. We're going to have to be willing to part with some things. We're going to have to be prepared to say goodbye to some people. We're going to have to be prepared to just leave sometimes without saying goodbye. Following Jesus does come at a cost, but as Jesus points out for us in Matthew 10, 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake, shall find it. That's right. That's right. Are we willing to follow Jesus to lose our own lives for his sake that we may find ourselves in him? For what shall it profit a man, folks, if we shall gain the whole world and yet lose our own soul? I'm here to tell you, there is no profit in that 
There is no gain in that. Like Andrew, like now Cephas, like James, like John, Philip is now following Jesus. Like the four before him, no doubt Philip gave up what he had known. He gave up what he was comfortable with. He gave up what at the time seemed normal to him to follow Jesus. And he followed the one who only days earlier had been introduced to this land as the Lamb of God. You know the faith that it takes that just three days earlier, John the Baptist reveals, behold, the Lamb of God? The faith that it takes to follow. Listen, if some whack job preacher comes into La Quinta and says to follow me after him just being here for three days, um, I'm going to pump the... Bro, bro, excuse me. Who are you? Where did you come from? What is your background? Who's your mom? Who's your dad? What did you do before you? So we're going to have some questions, are we not? I mean, we would, it would be wise of us to discern somebody that, that would show up on the scene like that only after three days. Right, right. But I would submit that Andrew, Peter, James, John, now Philip, and soon to be Bartholomew, they knew exactly who Jesus was. Why? Because they had been prepared for his arrival. Folks, the day is going to come when we who have been preparing for his arrival will not be caught off guard when it happens. But for those that are not prepared for Jesus' return, they are going to be caught off guard like they've never been caught off guard before. Right. Right. Preparation is key to being ready when the king comes to get his church. Word has now spread quickly in their little town of Bethsaida. It's where Peter and Andrew were from. And, and if John and James weren't from there, which I believe they were, because, because remember, if you go back to Matthew chapter 4, it says after Jesus uh, called upon Andrew and Peter, right away they go and get James and John. So they had to at least be in Bethsaida, if not in the town over. They lived very close. Because again, they too were fishermen. Remember, Andrew and Peter, James and John, now, I mean, they're all fishermen. It's a tight little community there. Cana and Bethsaida right there on, on the sea, it was a tight little community. Now after Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. So Philip too and I'll go back to making the same point. Philip, too, had to be prepared to know who Jesus was. He had to know the scriptures. He had to know the sign. He had to know what Moses and the law and the prophets spoke about in regards to the Messiah. But Nathaniel's response is a little off-putting. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there anything good? Something had to have been wrong with Nazareth. Either they were like back-to-back -back champs in soccer. Like, you know, those. if you go over to Europe and you have a champion town of soccer, every town around them hates that town because they're constantly winning. Or the people from that town are just rotten and despicable people. But either way, Nazareth had a reputation to make Nathaniel say, can anything good come from Nazareth? But what does Philip tell him? Why don't you come and see for yourself? Why don't you come and see for yourself what I'm telling you right now? Like we saw Andrew zealous for the Lord and, and going to tell his brother Simon about Jesus, Philip goes and tells his friend Nathaniel, who again is also called Bartholomew in the other synoptic gospels, the good news about him who Moses and the prophets wrote about. Again, there's this excitement, folks. There's this excitement from those who, who have found Jesus and they want to share it with their closest friends and family. And you can imagine Philip 
You know, he's like, he's, he's Nathan, Nathan, or maybe it was Bart, because he's Bart, 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 buddy, friend, whoever he was being called. He goes, the one that we've been hoping for, the one that we've been waiting for, the Messiah, I found him. Now, no, you didn't, because, man, no good could come out of that town. Philip goes, dude, come with me. I'm going to show you how awesome this is. I'm stoked. I can't wait to introduce you to him. you got to believe, right, when, 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 when Nathaniel responded to Philip about the whole Nazareth comment, man, the wind being taken out of Philip's sail for a moment. You got this great, exciting news, and, and man, you're, you're, you're ready, and you want to, Philip, come with, or Nathan, come with me, I, I want to show you this. Man, nothing good could come out of Nazareth. I mean, just the, really, man, really, you got to burst my bubble. With all the excitement I have right now, and you're going to burst my bubble. You know, you're riding on cloud nine, you're excited about Jesus, you're excited about who you found, you're excited about what he's done for you. He takes away the sins of the world. Only to have your friend, maybe it's a family member, tell you, there's nothing good about that. There's nothing good that can come out of that. Folks, we all get discouraged sometimes when we're sharing the gospel, when we're telling people about Jesus, the anticipation, the buildup, the butterflies, the hope of someone. I, just one person, just say to me, tell me more. Right. T tell me more. Don't we all anticipate that? Only to be told, yeah, okay, whatever. Folks, it bursts the bubble like a pinprick on a balloon, man. It's frustrating sometimes. It's discouraging sometimes. It makes you question, is it worth it? Well, to Philip, it was. To Philip, it was. Because he tells his bro beans, his buddy, dude, come and see. Don't, don't take it for what I'm telling you. You need to come and see this yourself. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. And Nathanael's response to Jesus is, Whence knowest thou me? Like, like how, how do you know me? Who, who are you? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, before Philip got to you, Nathan, when you were under that fig tree over there, I saw you. Whoa. All right. All right. Whoa. F first of all, how did you see me? And second of all, how did you see me where you're right? I was there before Philip got to me. Right. It's just some of the greatest dialogue in the Gospels here, church family. Jesus, who sees Nathan coming, announces his arrival. Folks, nowhere else in the Gospels does Jesus announce the arrival of anybody else. Think about this for a moment. Right. Nowhere else does he announce the arrival. Behold, John the Baptist. You would think maybe John the Baptist would, would be worthy of an announcement by Jesus. Right. Behold, Simon Peter. I mean, after all, Jesus changed his name. Behold, this centurion that, that at the time, if you remember in Matthew, Jesus had never seen so great a faith as the centurion. That the, Jesus never pronounced the arrival of anybody in the Gospels, folks. But here with Nathaniel, he does. The one and only person in all the scriptures that Jesus announces the arrival of. Folks, if anybody was worthy of having their arrival announced, it was Jesus. And yet he's announcing the arrival of Nathaniel. And yet Nathaniel, not Peter, not James, not John, not the leaders of the pack, if you will, because you kind of had your top three disciples, right? I think we can argue that, that Peter, James, and John were kind of like the leaders of the pack. None of them are announced. But Jesus says, behold, in other words, look, an Israelite, speaking of Bartholomew, 
in whom is no guile. And what's Nathan's response? Bro, how do you know me? How do you know me? And Jesus doing what Jesus does in typical Jesus fashion, he says, Nathaniel, before your buddy Philip over there, before he came to you, I saw you under that tree. This omnipresent statement by Jesus had to have shaken Bartholomew to his very core. And his only response to Jesus at this point was this, Rabbi, Rabbi or Master. Indeed, he says, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. It took just one statement from Jesus to convince Nathaniel, I saw you, for him to say, behold, you are who you say you are. In his response, we see three separate yet fitting titles used by Nathaniel to address Jesus. He indeed was rabbi. Andrew called him that earlier. He indeed was the son of God. He indeed was the king of Israel. Three separate, separate titles that he's given to Jesus. And either by revelation of the spirit of God or by his own deduction, Nathaniel knew exactly who was in front of him. It was the one who had announced his arrival just moments before. And in verses 50 and 51, as a reminder, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, this is Jesus speaking, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Folks, as if the fact that Jesus told him that he was sitting under the fig tree wasn't enough of a miracle for Nathaniel, which it was, by the way. Right, right. Jesus proceeds to tell him, you're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see greater things than this, Nathaniel. In fact, he tells him, you're going to see heaven itself open up and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Nathan, you ain't seen nothing yet, bro. Right. Now of note, church family, is the fact that Jacob had a similar dream to what Jesus just described to Nathaniel. In Genesis 28, 12, it says this, about Jacob, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Jacob had this vision thousands of years before Jesus himself said, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. Is there a correlation between the two? I'm sure there is. The only two places in scripture where angels are being ascending and descending to earth from heaven. But what I want to close with is this, church family. For the first time in John's gospel, from verse 51, we see Jesus being referred to as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. In fact, he calls himself that. Why is that of significance? Now, clearly since the beginning of the chapter, we've seen that Jesus is the Son of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, right out of the gate, begins to form for you and I who Jesus is. He is the Word. We know that as you continue through John 1, He becomes the Son of God. 
He becomes the Lamb of God. Now Jesus says of himself, I am also the Son of Man. This other side, if you will, of the divine person, Jesus Christ, being presented to us. Jesus Christ, folks, as the God-man, is both God and yet fully man. As Son of Man, he would undergo in all ways the human experience. As Son of Man, he would die with and for our sins as our substitute. As Son of Man, he would rise from the grave in a glorified body. And as son of man, he will someday sit up on the throne of David as king over all the earth. That is why he had to be the son of God and why he had to be the son of man. He had to be the son of man, church family. He had to experience personhood just like you and I do. He had to, in all ways, be tempted, yet be found with no guile in him. He had to be the son of man. Church family, I had one point today. Follow me. The question by this point shouldn't be, is Jesus worth, worth following? Because I think that we have established that he is. The question should be for us all, am I following Jesus? Am I following him the way he told us to follow him? Having lost our own lives for his sake, that we may truly find them. Have I done what Jesus said to do and denied myself? Denied my desires and denied my wants and denied my flesh and denied my thoughts. Denied everything about me and picked up my cross and followed him. Is that how we're following Jesus today? I pray that it can be said of Revelation Church, of its pastor and of its body, that we have indeed decided to follow Jesus. Because when we do, church family, there's no turning back. No turning back. Amen? Amen? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Lord God, thank you for the encouragement from the scriptures. Lord, even in meeting characters and personalities from the Bible, Lord, in meeting Simon Peter and meeting Philip and meeting Nathaniel, Lord God, even in just that, there is so much that we can glean from the pages of Scripture. There's so much meat for us there to digest and to take in, Father God. And Lord, with one simple point today, Lord God, follow me. It is my heart's desire that this church family, Lord, that this body of believers would desire to follow you. Lord, if they're not right now, Father, would they stop what they're doing? Would they turn back from where they're going? And would they decide right now to follow you? Father God, would you be glorified in us? Be glorified in our bodies? Be glorified in our thoughts? Be glorified in our ways? Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you. I want to pray right now, Lord, over our, our church family barbecue and pool party. Lord God, may we just enjoy some great fellowship right now father god would you bless the food keep us safe as we're in and out of the pool and in and out of the backyard lord god i just thank you and i love you and i ask and pray this all in the mighty name of jesus amen amen